Have a quiz. What is the first commandment in the Bible? Anybody just have a guess? What is the first commandment in the Bible? I mean, you know, if it's the first thing that God commands people, we should... Um, Love, that's the greatest commandment. Love the Lord your God, and that's in Deuteronomy 4. <clears throat> it's, uh, and uh, uh, in the first four commandments of uh, the Ten Commandments is, uh, has to do with our love for God. But the first commandment to appear in the pages of the Bible is in Genesis chapter 1, and it's verse 28. And it says... And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply. Now, be fruitful. Those, those first two words that he spoke to, to man. Uh, the context there means, uh, of course, children, multiply. Uh, someone observed that nowhere in the Bible... Has God ever rescinded that command? You wouldn't know it from just a cursory view of our society today. Um, and there's a lot to say on that, but uh, not today. Fruitful, though, is the word I want to focus on. It can mean other things. Uh, for instance, a fruitful business trip may mean financial gain successful business trip but for a Christian businessman fruitful may also mean spiritual results I want to see if you recognize the guy on the, your left anybody know who that is Colson Chuck Colson uh, written a number of books, uh, founded a prison fellowship, touched thousands of lives. Um, who's the other guy? <laughs> Probably wouldn't have a clue unless you had maybe researched it. Uh, Athanasius Leonidas Philippides was born in Turkey in 1924 with Greek parents obviously you know a name like Philippides uh, when he was about 12 his widowed mother moved to the US where he became Thomas Leonard Phillips Tom Phillips completed high school in Boston graduated from college got a job at a large corporation named Raytheon does it begin to sound familiar if you've read anything about Colson? In 20 years, he was CEO, and under his leadership, this company, it was an amazing leadership. Um, this company diversified and grew and flourished. Um, they marketed the first home microwave. Remember the good, solid Amana microwave? Um, that was put out by Raytheon. Uh, they developed the Patriot missile system. And shortly after becoming CEO, however, this is probably the most notable thing in my estimation, in 1968, he gave his life to Christ at a Billy Graham crusade in New York. In 1973, five years later, he led a man to Jesus. His name was Chuck Colson. Thousands of lives were changed by Colson's ministry and his books. Many of those people were serving time in prison and it's still happening. Now in 2018, 
A few months before Tom's death at almost age of almost 95, Colson's daughter, Emily, went to see him. She writes, Tom was just as gracious and gentle as I had remembered, welcoming me into his home. We sat around his kitchen table, enjoying food and conversation. And then I pulled out a manila envelope. Tom, I brought you a gift, I said, as I fought back the tears. This is nothing, and this is everything. I could barely speak past the lump in my throat. Tom, I want to thank you, I began. You were obedient to Christ. You shared your faith with my dad. And because of that, thousands of lives were changed. You know that. But Tom, this is personal. My life was changed too. My tears were now uncontrollable. One of his caregivers brought me a box of tissues. When my dad gave his life to Christ, it gave me my dad back. Maybe for the first time. And she went on and concluded, and then my son gave his life to Christ. You see how the gift keeps on giving. It was what Colson saw in Philip's life that drew him. He didn't go there to hear how to come to Christ. He just went there because he was in the midst of all this stuff with Nixon and Watergate and his own uh, role in that. And uh, he was just, uh, everything was just coming apart. And he saw in Phillips, who was a friend, what he, what drew him. And it was, what he saw was the likeness of Jesus. And we see that likeness of Jesus described in Galatians 5.22 as the fruit of the Spirit. But the fruit of the Spirit is love. Peace. Joy. Patience. Kindness. Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Let's say those together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. <clears throat> Those are nine. Uh, there's, it's, it's not an exhaustive list. Uh, there's lots of other qualities. But those just kind of round uh, out a picture of Jesus. Now, notice that list is what the Holy Spirit works in us. When I first started reading the Bible seriously and I came to that list, <clears throat> I thought, oh my goodness, I've got to start working on uh, patience. I've got to try harder to love. And I saw it as a, a list of ought to's. You know, here's what, Jerry, you need to be start being like. And, uh, so I began to fake it, and then some stressful situation would bring out the real Jerry, or at least at that time, and uh, those fruit weren't in my life. It's not a list of things that we should try harder to be like. On our own, our own human effort, our human nature produces bad fruit. And those are listed in Galatians 5, 19, 21. The acts of the flesh are obvious. 
sexual immorality, impurity, debauchery, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, discord, jealousy, anger, fits of rage, selfish ambition. Now it sounds like we're reading the newspaper. Dissensions, factions, division, and envy, drunkenness, orgies, and the like. I warn you, as I did before, that those who keep on living like this, it doesn't say if you've ever been like that. It just says the, the, the Greek tense there of, of um, those who live um, like this, um, it's a present continuous. Those who keep on living like this, they will not inherit the kingdom of God. It's important to understand what the Bible says about our flesh and our spirit. The flesh is our fallen human nature. We inherit it from Adam, we're born with it, and we're stuck with it. We can't, we're in bondage to it until we're set free by Jesus. And that's why Jesus says you must be born again, born anew, born from above. You can't fix flesh. That's the Bible version. You can't change anyone with instructions or threats or trying to appease them. Someone said trying to appease a, an aggressive nation is like throwing a stake to a tiger hoping that it will turn him into a vegetarian. It's not his nature, it's not going to work. That's why we have protection of the Patriot missile system and all the other stuff. <clears throat> but you can pray for a new nature for that person, for yourself. A nature that the, uh, the Holy Spirit brings into our life, it takes that dead spirit within us that doesn't read the Bible, doesn't care, doesn't pay any attention to God, never thinks, give him a thought all day long, uh, turns them into someone that is starting to have a spiritual sensitivity because your spirit now can, can connect with the spirit of God. That's called regeneration, a new heart. Over 400 years ago, the Scottish Presbyterians understood how the Holy Spirit and uh, th something called the Scots Confession. And uh, I, just here's an excerpt. For as soon as the Spirit of God, of, of the Lord Jesus, whom God's chosen children receive by faith, takes possession of the heart of any man, so soon does the Holy Spirit regenerate and renew him so that the regenerate man, the born anew man, begins to hate what before he loved and to love what he hated before. Then comes that continual battle which is between the flesh and the spirit in God's children. Well, the flesh and the natural man being corrupt, lust for things pleasant and delightful to themselves, or envious in adversity, proud in prosperity, and every moment prone and ready to offend the majesty of God. It's not a pretty picture of the human nature there that's painted the flesh and so 
the question that I have when I read that is, how do we fight that continual battle against our own nature? How do we succeed in overcoming the flesh? And Galatians 5, 24, 24, and those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. Crucified, not tolerate, but aggressively crucified, die to self, give up your will, your will, and desire only God's will in your life. So that you go through life singing, I need you. Oh, how I need you. Oh, Lord, help me. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. See the word? They're crucified. That's, that's a pretty, um, that, that's not a, a mild-mannered word. And that's the attitude you should have towards your old nature, your flesh. I have been crucified with Christ. You don't have to do it alone. In fact, one Bible teacher says, um, you, you're not going to crucify yourself. You, you, you'll, use, you'll use rubber nails. Um, so, we need help for that. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, i got to walk around in this body for a while yet, I live by faith of the Son of God, trusting Him who loved me and gave Himself for me. You remember that you can't fix yourself. When we receive Jesus, we receive His crucifixion, and his resurrection in our life. So, what must we do? Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Romans 13, 14. Make no provision for the flesh to gratify his desires. Don't feed it. Most of the time, uh, that, that, well, that, your, your old nature will damage your soul, damage your character, damage your relationships, and your witness. And when you mess up, most of the time, don't blame the demons. One person came to this Bible teacher and says, uh, uh, Mr. Mumford, uh, I have some demons that I want you to cast out. And he looked at her, and with some prompting from the Holy Spirit, he said, I wish you did. <laughs> your problem, lady, is your flesh. So, don't blame the demons. Actually, it's your flesh. It's, it's the only thing they have to work with. They are, they're not going to influence your spirit. They're not going to tie into your spirit. But they sure can ride your flesh and make your day miserable. So, the weaker our old nature becomes, the less that the enemy has to work with, the less the enemy can lead us astray. Um, First Peter 2 says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh. And maybe the passion sounds a little strong, just feelings. You know, people say, follow your heart. Uh, well, I have a feeling I need to do this. Really, really take it to the Lord and check it out. Because feelings can, uh, can goof you up. Um, so, the sojourners and exiles 
is a sojourners, you know, it just means somebody who travels a lot. And exiles means somebody who's living where they don't really belong. That's us. Um, you are holy aliens. You are the true aliens from outer space. Because you are citizens of God's kingdom. So be careful that you don't live like the world around you. It's so hard to live in a lake and not get wet. Uh, that's what makes a boat kind of handy. In fact, a boat belongs in the lake. Its boat is made for the lake. But the lake does not belong in the boat. And the boat people is the church. It's us. It's the fellowship of believers. And that helps to protect you from the world around you. Yes, you interact with the world. But you do it with um, gloves on or something, a mask. Uh, <laughs> you know, you, you've got to be there but you don't want it to rub off on you. So, the human nature doesn't give up easily. I have a story about that, uh, about a raccoon. It's a horrible story, and I'm not going to tell it to you here in church. <laughs> but the human nature doesn't give up easily. So starve it. Don't gratify it or indulge in it. Don't feed it. Say no. Abstain from what the flesh wants. This is why sometimes fasting can be a helpful discipline. Oh, the flesh hates that word discipline, doesn't it? The flesh also hates the word correction or hates to be corrected. You... Uh, Maybe try to correct somebody and they smile and they say, oh, thank you. I didn't realize that. I appreciate you telling me that. Probably not. They might. Um, but, uh, you know, I, one of the things I miss with, uh, with my wife being gone is her... Uh, telling me if, you know, maybe I'll go dress for some occasion and I come out and she looks at me and she goes. <laughs> so I, she tells me what colors go with what and, you know, what works. Um, we need correction. One big help is reading the Bible. God's word every morning and that will actually prune away at your flesh the more you read the Bible the more it prunes away at that wrong growth your battle against your old human nature can be discouraging it's a long war when you think you've got it kind of licked you blow your stack and you lose it but don't lose heart don't pull your troops out because the war is so long let Jesus be your general your commanding general he never loses in fact from John 15 Jesus is speaking to you this very minute. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. 
Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. Those, that, those words right there are underlined in my Bible. If anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish. Because with Christ living in you and your mind filled with his word, the things that you wish are going to be the things that are in accord with his will. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit. That's the take home this morning. When you bear fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, your Father in heaven is glorified. And you prove to be his disciples. Uh, Just count the words the number of times abide appears in that. Has somebody got them counted? How many? There's actually two sections there. Um, All together, from four through eight, I think it appears seven times. Um, do you think Jesus is trying to tell you something? The word abide means to set up housekeeping, to live there, to move in permanently, to remain, to live with, to stay attached to, total dependence upon. And so, that is what he means to walk in the spirit if you live by the spirit Paul points out in Galatians 5.25 if you live by the spirit that means if you've been born anew by the spirit then walk in the spirit that means whatever you do wherever you go you are depending upon the Holy Spirit the helper And the fruit is going to start to show in your life. Not that you are going to notice, but other people will. The more the fruit appears, the less you are worried or thinking about yourself. Someone says, as we mature in Christ, we don't think less of ourselves we think of ourselves less. Just not self-conscious anymore because we're conscious of Jesus. Walking in the Spirit. Learn what that means, to walk in the Spirit. And then pray and ask for the grace to do it. The Holy Spirit is your helper, your personal helper. Lord, we pray for that help. We thank you that you have not left us alone, left us as orphans, um, but you have sent your Holy Spirit to not just walk along beside us, but to live within us, to speak to our spirit, our heart, our new heart. And we pray, Lord, that you would work the miracle of crucifying the old nature and letting the fruit of the Spirit, the likeness of Jesus, show in our lives. We want that. In Jesus' name, amen.